The next speaker is Professor Eike Steinmann, who is the director of the Department of Molecular and Medical Virology at the Ruhr University in Bochum in Germany. He will be talking about transmission and inactivation of SARS-CoV-2. Over to you, Professor Steinmann, and thank you in advance. Thank you very much, Dr. Maywald. I would like to thank the organizers, Matthias and Kevin, for inviting me and sharing some data on the transmission and inactivation of SARS-CoV-2. I'm by training a virologist, so you, so you will see in this talk a couple of virology experimental approaches to address this question and also basically lab studies where we try to mimic ways of transmission and also how you can inactivate the virus. So let me start with the general introduction. What do we know about stability of human pathogenic virus in general and what we can we expect from a coronaviruses and, for example, other viruses that might occur also in the future? An important criteria on the stability and inactivation if, is if a virus has an envelope, here like you see on the left side, or has an, no envelope. And the viruses with an envelope, this lipid um, character, are very easy to inactivate in general and are not very stable. Like other examples are HIV, hepatitis C virus, influenza virus, and also coronavirus belong to that envelope virus with a strong lipophilic character. The other part on the right side, you know, may know that like the norovirus as an fecal oral transmission on a cruise ship outbreak, these are viruses or adenovirus that can persist for months in the environment, in water and also on surfaces. So these are the most stable viruses, you know. And coronavirus are basically in principle for virologists and very unstable um, virus. Then let's talk about inactivation and transmission of that. I would like to also show here that's a topic of hygiene disinfection that we would say is the primary prevention strategy. Other ones are basically raising awareness, something what we do today, vaccination, reduction of viral exposure, cleaning of blood products, for example, and this virus inactivation and hygiene. And Professor Morawska talked already like UV inactivation in the case of aerosol transmission. And secondary prevention is basically the identification of infected people and treatment of infected people. When it's too late and an individual is already infected, and then we can also help basically treating that individual. So let's start with the different ways of transmission. And I would like not to repeat in much detail the talk from Professor Morawska, which talked about the um, droplet and in detail the aerial transmission, what we know, how it's there transmitted. That's the main way of SARS-CoV-2 virus transmission, that's clear. We have a lot of examples that this is the case. And I will briefly touch on the experimental approaches to that topic. And then we'll also talk, which is mainly important in the medical sector and in hospitals and not such in high topic for the individual going shopping and the general publication, is a direct contact by hand. We know that pathogens transmission and nosocomial transmission, other viruses, and we'll talk here, what's the role of this direct contact by hands in, in the hospital. And the other big question is, what about the indirect contact? There's been a lot of studies and discussion about door handles, patient beds, other surfaces, what kind of role this plays, and what kind of disinfection and inactivation strategies here we need to apply. And in the hospital, we have the challenge that there's not only SARS-CoV-2, there we could have kind of a norovirus or other pathogens that are stable for months and weeks and need harsh inactivation procedures. So here we always have to kind of good middle way of inactivation, even if there's only coronavirus detected, but you never know what is also basically here and what kind of hygiene measures you need in the hospital environment. So let's start with the briefly with the stability of SARS-CoV-2 and aerosols. We have seen some data in the previous talk. Yeah, I would just like to mention there are basically only two experimental studies. From a virology point of view, it's very difficult to study that. So we would like to use a genetic clone or a virus that you generate in the laboratory, then generate an aerosol and measure this infectivity and also apply and run the condition, temperature, et cetera. What has been done is often that you can detect the particles and aerosols from patients that are coughing and are infected. But we would also like to manipulate basically and by experiments the situation and study viruses and aerosols, how we can inactivate them and what characteristics they are. One on the left side, this 
very famous study in the New England Journal 2020, which they compared also SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 stability in aerosols for a couple of hours. There was not even decreased after three hours to background levels. And another study from the US, but they looked also at the plug farming units. So it's really the infectivity, not only the genome detected by PCR, that they found in half lifetime stability up to 16 hours in aerosol. So these are experimental approaches, not directly comparable to clinical approaches. But as I said, there's still a clear lack for virology experiments. Also, I have to say, due to biosafety, that's in Germany very restricted, you cannot just easily perform aerosols with SARS CoV 2 also in a um, laboratory environment. So let's look at the second way. As I mentioned, nosocomial transmission, hand contact. What do we know there? We know hygiene and also hand washing is an important measure. And we have good examples already from SARS-CoV-1 that hygiene correlates with lower nosocomial transmission. And also in SARS-CoV-2, there are not so much studies. It always takes some time. But also here, insufficient hand hygiene of medical staff um, correlated with higher SARS-CoV-2 infection risks. So here in a hospital environment, it's quite clear that hands, as also for other pathogens, play a role in the transmission. And we now would like to share now our first study. We're interested early on the pandemic, are the disinfectants and the alcohols that are the ingredients of disinfectants appropriate to inactivate SARS-CoV-2 as an envelope virus? So in the WHO recommends two hand drops formulations already from 2009. Code formulation one and two, one is based on ethanol and the other one on isopropyl alcohol um, that they also share and are easy also to mix up also in countries that do not have easy access to commercial disinfectant regions. But they are also pretty close to other commercial products. And already in 2017, we did a study where we looked at the activity of these WHO formulation and inactivating a lot of emerging viruses. So we looked at Zika, Ebola, hepatitis C virus, influenza, but we included at that time already three coronaviruses, an animal bovine coronavirus, that's a reference virus where also laboratory workers have no risk to get infected, but we included also SARS and MERS already in 2017. And we could easily here show, you see that it's a so-called suspension test on the y-axis. You see the viral titers with 10 million virus particles and already 40%, the in-use concentration is 80%, were easily and sufficient to inactivate MERS and SARS with these alcohols and WHO um, formulation. So from these data from 2007, we already knew that the envelope characteristic and the virology characteristic should be quite close between the coronaviruses, that we expect a good inactivation of SARS-CoV-2. This study we did then only in spring 2020, we were the first one to show that proven and formally shown that the WHO formulation here on the top bar are able to inactivate coronavirus completely. This is a 30 second incubation time like hand hygiene. And we compared that to our older data. And you can see here in this analysis, SARS-CoV-2 behaves very similar to the other coronaviruses in this family. Importantly, I don't know how it was in other countries worldwide in the US, but we had a shortage in commercial disinfectant Basically, in Germany, in, in hospitals, that pharmacy stores had to basically mix up their own disinfectant reagents and sold them on um, to hospitals and also to individuals. We also made this WHO formulation. In Germany, also, we had changes in the laws that was allowed to do that. And importantly, basically, we could show that ethanol and propanol are sufficient as um, disinfectant reagents to innovate SARS-CoV-2 at low concentration as also ingredients of hand disinfections. What about soap? Also from theory, we know it's an envelope viruses and soap molecules basically destroy this envelope, but nobody has really shown that in the laboratory. So the hand washing, we have a second effect, not only that the soap kills the envelope, but also you have a mechanically effect by the rinse of the water. So also just the virus also get rinsed into the sink by the hand washing in addition to the inactivation. But that's why at least 20 seconds and of course for medical staff, the hygiene rule should be applied. So here this slide shows you now results that we did a year later in 2021 that people asked us, can you confirm your older data of virus inactivation also with the variants of concerns? At that time, this is here the Wuhan, the Alpha and the Beta variant. Delta and Omicron were not there yet at that time. 
And we could show that for ethanol, there is no difference that also the other variants of concern could be easily inactivated. And we have not tested it for Omicron, but I'm 100% sure that it would be the same results. Importantly, here was the first time that really somebody showed that for soap. Um, so here, one minute or 30 seconds of soap. This is then without water rinse. It's in a test tube test that basically inactivates SARS-CoV-2. This is also for non-medical staff important information. So, so far to the hands that, of course, there are risk of direct contact and nosocomial transmission, but basically that standard hygiene rules, all disinfection approaches can be applied and are working in SARS-CoV-2 when there are no unexpected results. Mainly, as we heard before, the aerosol transmission is the more critical one to prevent. Now, what about the indirect contact, the surfaces, or what roles do they play? So here we also invested a couple of experimental approaches to look into that. One was, where we get a lot of feedback because probably it was February 22, when there was when the first cases were in Europe, where we published a review just about the information we had about coronavirus on intimate surface. And this was from SARS-CoV-1, MERS, and other coronaviruses, also the normal seasonal coronaviruses. So this review was highly impressed and highly cited. And we got a lot of feedback with that because there was some information from other studies. So it's a literature review that the virus is stable for a couple of days in the environment. And people really were aware that this is risky and, and a problem and were afraid to touch surfaces that they could get infected. Also to touch posts and packages for that. So let's look into detail what is a couple of years later the knowledge now and how would we address this. Then the second information we had on the first data was there were a lot of studies where people performed PCRs and made swaps from patient rooms in the air, but also floors, door handle, chair. I know also from carotene hotel rooms, everything was investigated. And by PCR, you find this RNA basically everywhere. Positive samples in rooms where infected in the world were basically sitting or living. So you see that here, but interestingly, so far, these samples were all PCR positive. So far, no infectious viruses could be swapped or samples from a surface. This has not been really published. And we have some studies, as we've already seen, from aerosols infectivity. Their PCR is positive. Infectivity has been shown by one study, but has not really confirmed that I would say it's still also a topic of investigation. But as you know, the PCR detects just the viral genome, and it doesn't mean that this infectious virus material, but these studies raise a lot of awareness that the virus is here present and could be there for a long time. And then there was this other very, very famous study in New England journal where they could show the virus can on plastics and stainless steel could be detected up to two or three days on surfaces. And this here are infectivity data but in a laboratory protected environment, I have to say. And the doses were not so high. These surfaces were inoculated. It's also a matter, the doses of inoculum, but they were kind of moderate between 10 to 3 and 10 to the 4. We then also investigated that and asked the next question, what about the temperature influence on surfaces due to the seasonality between winter and summer of coronaviruses? Something that we really did not expect that we could see not much differences. This is here the kinetic at room temperature that at four degrees, the half-life time was quite similar. And that was kind of surprising for me that at 30 degrees, the half-life time is no big reduction, at least also here in this experimental laboratory test. So this is without UV light. I have to say this is just temperature parameter tested. But then, as I showed before, we also had this study with the soap and the variants of concerns. We also then asked the question, are the variants of concerns and the other coronaviruses differently survivable on surfaces? This was not the case compared to the Wuhan strain. The At least the Alpha and Beta variant were on stainless steel and on surgical masks basically showed the same stability and comparable sensibility. There were no differences that one of the variants is now very highly stable compared to another coronavirus of the SARS-CoV-2. Then we also work together with the European Central Bank. This is not directly to the hospital, but I would like to show these data because we developed a new assay to not look at only at the contaminated surface, but to go a step further and develop a new assay to look also what adds the finger. So if you touch the surface, so what is the contamination 
on your hand. And with that, we basically use banknotes as a surface, but it applies also to other surfaces and we use the stainless steel always as a control. And similar what I have just shown in the New England Journal, you can see on a banknote, this is now euros, not dollars, but there are also a couple of studies out for um, US banknotes. You see the two to three days stability on infectivity of the virus on the euro banknote. Interestingly, the coins, the 10 cent and 5 cent euro coins are made out of copper. Basically here, the stability is lower compared to a one euro coin. This is the steel disk here as the positive control. So here we see only a few hours stability on the cent coins of infectivity. But now what I would like to focus on is basically next we develop a so-called touch transfer assay, which is more realistic and just not shows the infectivity of the virus on the surface which shows how much infectivity do I transfer to my hand? And then I even need to touch my mouth or nose or shake the hand to transmit the virus. So because it's SARS-CoV-2, we cannot just touch it. We used artificial skin where we put the finger on to then to do this um, transmission. And we, you see here these pictures, we contaminated Euro banknotes or 10 cent coins. This is plastic mimicking like more credit card and this is stainless steel. And interestingly, that's also here now the data of the transfer assay. If this is still liquid and you see still the virus point and the mic touch transfer immediately, you can transfer the virus to your finger. But more the realistic scenario is that the virus, you don't see it's not wet and you don't see it. So after drying of about 30 minutes, which would be also the case for the cash flow of coins and dollars, you see there's no infectivity transferred to the finger when we inoculant with moderate viral titers that realistic of transmitted. So showing that you can detect the virus on the surface even for some time or days, but it doesn't mean that after drying, you cannot transfer it to the finger and therefore you cannot really transfer it to the next individual. So who's interested in that, this abstract here is published in iScience last year, who's interested in that study in more detail. As I said, it was together developed with the European Central Bank to show that these kind of touch transfer assays are more realistic and to study the transfer of the virus in infectivity instead of just measuring it on surfaces or detecting by PCR RNA in the environment. Now I would like to come to the end and I think most important study to really clarify and more clinically relevant what roads to surfaces really play. And for that, we aim to go back to the patient and let positive individuals cuff on these steel discs that we before contaminated artificially with infectious virus. And then we waited for two hours and sampled a lot of kind points and we knew that we take a swap we let them cough on the steel disc, and we even let them put the steel disc into the mouse and moisture it to check for infectivity basically on the steel disc after moisturing it. And then these samples we brought into the biosafety lab, put it on cell culture, and then looked for infectivity as well as for the viral genome and followed these infections. So these were a lot of samples, and we had, I think, 15 patients overall coughing on these materials. And overall, it's a complex slide and P1, P2, P3 are three different individuals. Here, it just, it's just color coded. So uh, the darker it is, the more infectivity in oculum we see. So just to guide you through, the swab was positive and it was infectious in cell culture. And we can also passage the virus that was generated from these patients. Also, the moisturing is positive. So if the individuals put the stethis into the mouse, you can passage the virus, it's infectious and generate new infectious virus. However, from interesting, the most important one from the coughing and then putting that into culture, basically no infectious virus could be recovered. Um, summarizing that there's a really low risk of transmission after this aerosol transmission on surfaces, basically, and then the risk of surfaces to a new chain of transmission. So with that, I would already come to my summary and with the talk from Dr. Moravskova about the aerosol droplet transmission. And she showed that here, the rules basically distance and mask and also in the prevention strategies. Direct contact by hands and nose transmission, especially in the hospital environment. Hygiene is an important rule. 
And as I said, not only for SARS-CoV-2, we have far other viruses that are far more stable, far more resistant. And with good hygiene measures basically also helps against these other bugs and not only SARS-CoV-2. And indirect surfaces is, in our opinion, no major player for SARS-CoV-2 transmission. Also, like we had so much calls of scarred card players, poker players, table tennis, basketball. Do I need to infect the basketball after the game? This is, in our view, not a relevant way of transmission. In the hospital environment, it's again a little bit different. There we can have high risk of contamination, other pathogens possible. So here we need, of course, to clean and be aware of that. But for the general way transmission outside that healthcare worker situation, it's not that highly relevant as initially thought. And with that, I would like to thank my team at the Molecular Medical Virology Bochum. And thank you very much for your attention.